is the the gratuitous hand clap for the pastor. Thank you very much. Boy, it's good to see you today. Glad to have you here. Victorville, it's always good to be with you, but also over in Apple Valley. Thank you guys for coming to our Apple Valley campus as well as in Phelan or Phelan, whatever you choose, but uh, we only have one uh, campus over in that part of the valley, so whether it's Phelan or Phelan, you're stuck with that one, but we're glad to have you here. If um, you need a copy of the outline at any of these locations, raise your hand. And our uh, hard-working ushers will find you. You're going to need some help following along today. I want to give you a heads up about a few things, pretty exciting things. First of all, uh, we put a book together some time ago about the basic premise for our ministry, the Oikos concept. And when that was released some years ago, it looked, um, it looked white with a, a black band. And then a few years after... Uh, we put that out, uh, we released it again, a revised edition, and it was a light blue cover. Now the reason that this is significant is because of the confusion within the body of Christ. This particular cover is an upgrade from the original white version. It's kind of like the Beatles' old white album, this is the white Oikos book. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, they were a rock group a long time ago, and uh, you're very young. This has added content, actually a couple chapters worth of material, and so if that interests you, this is what you would want. But this is what you can no longer have, because we've actually, once again, taken another step and changed the title. Now, if you have this book here, the, um, the revised edition, this is not going to give you anything new in terms of content. It's just a new title, 8 to 15, the world is smaller than you think. It's got a real cool little world on it with a piece of the world uh, removed for dramatic effect. That was a brilliant idea. I think I came up with that part of it, and that's what uh, we're doing now in terms of providing this as a resource to people, actually, you guys, all over the world. Now, it's, uh, we, it's, it's been published in, in three, working on four, even a fifth language now is in uh, process, and so we're very excited uh, about what the Lord is doing through High Desert Church and what we have been able to discover together over the last several decades of ministry. Now the reason, I just, I don't want you guys to be confused when you go out there, I, I'm really honestly, honestly not trying to sell books. When you go to the island and you see the 8 to 15 version, if, if you have that version there, you don't need another one. Don't buy it just because you think it's a new book, it's just a new title. We think it's a little more compelling in terms of... Uh, maybe uh, being a little provocative for people to actually want to pick it up and read it. Maybe there is somebody in your life who's a believer uh, that is really seeking to discover God's purpose for their existence. This might be good uh, for you to pass on to them. And also to pastors. If there's a pastor in your life that you would like to encourage maybe helping uh, them see what we have discovered, not that we're all that you know, brilliant or more... Um, uh, spirit-filled than those who haven't discovered this principle because it's a journey that we're all on together in trying to figure out how to better accomplish God's plan for his church. But if there's a pastor, we, we have conversations every week with pastors um, around the world actually and they want to uh, know what this is about and how we can better encourage them to, uh, to provide the resources for their church family that can be helpful to them as well. Okay? Okay, one other thing. We have re-released the Oikos website. It's now called 8to15.com, so write that down, 8to15. Uh, we blog on there. There's all kind of cool things just regarding the Oikos mission on there. It's not a different blog than the blog that is on our church website. This is different, but the blog is the same, so uh, it might seem different. And uh, so if you read both and you think they're different, then I blog twice as often as... I think. And then one last thing. Do you have a smartphone? Whether you have the Android Marketplace option or uh, the App Store on the iPhone, if you've got a smartphone, now for a long time I had a dumb phone. Uh, now the phone is smarter than the user uh, by a significant amount. In fact, the days of trying to be smarter than the phone you have are probably over for you too. But if you have 
a smartphone and you would like to download the HTC app, it's a new app that our comm guys, our tech guys have been pretty geeked up about, would actually be a, a literal term, and so you can go ahead and get that, you can stay connected. Let me just review what uh, you can do on this app. It's a great way to stay connected to everything from past messages uh, to blogs. Boy, there's another place you can read the blog. So I'll be blogging like three times more often than I thought. Uh, and then, uh, and you can even manage your small group from your smartphone. Um, and then it, it, it's completely free. And so, one other thing that you might be able to do if you have the app is you can actually go on the app, and the Bible is embedded in the app. And so you can read the Bible from the app as well as the message notes each weekend, the ones that you have in your possession today. If you are that like techno psycho and that's how you do everything in your life, you can do everything that you ever wanted to do and more from the new HTC app. Uh, and then it, uh, it also vacuums the house, so that'll, that'll be good for you <laughs> as well. Be a nice uh, little addition to your home. And the, and, and the app is free, so if, if, if we sound like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, we actually are because we tell you, turn off your cell phones. Now we're telling you, fire those bad boys up and uh, go to the Word of God and get the notes and uh, follow along with us if you would like. Well, today what we want to do is talk uh, about uh, death. In fact, our message is entitled, A Matter of Death and Life. Death is, is the first thing we want to look at and then life. And uh, so follow along if you'd like. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to look at the first part. Of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, you may have noticed that there's only one more chapter after this one, and so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to land our study out of 1 Corinthians, our sin city study that we've been involved in for much of 2011, and then we're going to engage a Christmas series and finish out the year talking about, about Christmas. And the denial of death, existentialist Ernest. Becker wrote this. He said, human activity is activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death. In other words, he says, we stay busy in our lives to avoid thinking about dying. That what motivates us to live, what gives us energy in our lives, is our fear of death. And while most of the world might be motivated by the fear of death, the Apostle Paul, in chapter 15 of this amazing letter that we've been going through together for all of these months, he wants Christians to be motivated by the death of fear. And if you are afraid of death, I hope that you'll listen very carefully, not this, just this weekend, but also next weekend, because we will, I trust, alleviate that fear for you. And so if you're in chapter 15, as I now am, we will prepare to see what the Apostle says about that. Uh, point number one, fill in this blank if you can, and I really apologize to you, but I think I'm going to sneeze, so if that happens and you're sitting in the splash zone, I apologize very much. <laughs> Those of you in Apple Valley and Phelan can, or Phelan, or if Phelan can be thankful that you're not going to be sprayed. And you know, even saying that kind of reduces the potential for sneezing at all. <laughs> but we'll see. If it happens, you're ready. Point number one, death is a portal. It's a portal. I think it was Calvin Miller who said, I don't fear death, it's dying that I'm not looking forward to. I guess what we want to do first and foremost is recognize the difference between death and dying because those are two different, completely different ideas. A lot like the difference between a wedding and a marriage. Yeah. Most people plan much better for their wedding than they do for their marriage and the marriage kind of lasts longer. So you have to look at those two ideas in different lights. Same thing with death and dying. And, and more often than not, dying is not pleasant but it passes quickly. In fact, 
you don't pass away. You just leave. I mean, I, I find it interesting that we use such morbid terminology to describe that departure. We would never use that kind of terminology when we talk about any other departure in, in our lives. Uh, is Bob in your office? Well, he was a few moments ago, but he passed away to the coffee room. <laughs> you know, it's just a departure. What time did John leave for the game? Well, as of 6.43 p.m., he is no longer with us. That was kind of a joke, but <laughs> bringing a little levity. But that's the point about death. You see, when we die, we just leave and go to a much more desirable location in a body that is a significant upgrade from the one that we have now. And that's it. You could actually say that death is the non-existent point that separates time from eternity. And even though you haven't reached the point of death, and I hope we can keep our record intact this weekend and not lose anyone uh, while we're speaking, but even though you may not have reached that point of death, right now you are still, actually, you are dying. You are dying right now. Good health is simply the slowest way to die. And if your health goes south, you accelerate the process, but everybody in this room right now is dying. You're in the process of dying. But we, we haven't reached the point of death, okay? Death is just a portal. We're in the process of dying, and then after we reach that portal, then we begin the process of really living. I mean, in a meaningful way that we have never experienced before. And that's why the whole vibe in chapter 15 is don't be afraid of death. All right, now we're in chapter 15. Look at verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters... I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, you might even underline that phrase of first importance. Because we try to tell you that all the time. The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the reason we call it the main thing is because the Apostle Paul says it's the main thing. And Jesus says it's the main thing. And everybody else that writes in the Bible says it's the main thing. The gospel is of first importance. Sharing the good news of salvation with our relational worlds. That world that actually is smaller than we think. The most important thing that we can do in our lives. And according to the apostle, the gospel has two points of reference. You can look at these points of reference on the map. You can find them in the Bible. The cross and the tomb. And so it's important to keep one eye on the cross, one eye on the tomb. Because when you look at the cross, you're reminded that in Christ you're forgiven. But it's also just as important to keep our other eye on the empty tomb and remember the benefit of that forgiveness. The cross, you could say, is where Jesus wrote the check to pay for our sin in full. But it was at the tomb where that check was validated with the bodily resurrection of Christ. The cross is about the payment. The tomb is about the power to back it up. Look at verse 5, and then he appeared after he was raised from the dead, speaking of Jesus. He appeared to Cephas, otherwise known as Peter, a.k.a. Petrus. And then to the twelve, the fellows. And by the way, the twelve is a designation for the disciples, because at this point in history, there's only eleven. One guy checked out. Judas checked out. And we haven't replaced Judas yet, officially, that takes place in the book of Acts. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, he first of all showed himself to Peter and then to the guys, the twelve, even though it's not twelve, just a designation for the disciples. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some have died. And then he appeared to James, 
James. And then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, Paul says. He appeared to me also. As one, he says, abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so when Jesus was raised from the dead, he showed himself to groups of people and to individuals. You see, God wants you to absolutely know that death is merely a portal. And so he provides proof. 500 first-hand testimonies is pretty powerful evidence. And, and when he wrote this, he said, and if you guys want to talk to any of those 500, it's not like hard to find them because most of them are still alive. You know, the resurrection is an incredible story. In some ways, it's an unbelievable story. In fact, for some people, it is actually the revealing of the resurrection in the scriptures that causes them to not believe the scriptures because it's just too incredible. In fact, that might be true for you. It might be what's keeping you from placing your faith in Christ. But whenever doubts begin to creep in about the veracity of the Christian faith, you might want to consider Luke's spiritual journey. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he wrote two books in the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. But the key about this guy Luke is that he was a doctor. And like any scientist would be, he wanted to know facts. He didn't want to deal with speculation. And his method of discovery would have impressed any superior court judge, any federal judge, any judge anywhere. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, this is how he begins. Verse 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were the first, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now, we don't know who Theophilus is. The name means friend of God. We're not even sure if he's a real guy. Just anybody might be in mind. Anyone who's a friend of God, who wants to know God. Luke might be writing this for them. On the other hand... Theophilus might actually be the defense attorney for the Apostle Paul. We don't know who this guy is. We do know who Luke was. And his desire was that you and I, like Theophilus, may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. You see, when the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, 500 people, many of them are still alive to this day, and you can go talk to them if you want to, Luke did. He actually went and did interviews. He sat down with people in groups and as individuals. Why? Because he was a scientist. He wanted to know the facts. In fact, his second volume, the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 3, he says, after his suffering, speaking of Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Many convincing proofs. Luke was convinced because Luke did his homework. And so whenever you begin to doubt anything about the resurrection, whenever you begin to doubt anything about Jesus, now I'm not telling you I can absolutely prove that what I teach you is accurate. I'm just telling you on the basis of the evidence and testimonies, not only of these 500 and these 12, these 12 guys who are like such wimps after Jesus died, and then within a matter of weeks, turn the world upside down in a manner that the world has not recovered from, actually. The Christian gospel, the world has not recovered from it. We mark history on the basis of that event. And the timeline that Paul gives the Corinthians is really significant. But more significant, I think, are the individuals that are sought out by Jesus. Now, this is really interesting because when Jesus revealed himself, he revealed himself to groups 
Over 500 at one time saw Jesus. The 12 saw Jesus at one time. But then he revealed himself individually to three guys. He revealed himself, first of all, to Peter. And you ask yourself the question, why, why, why Peter? I mean, these three guys. By the way, Peter, James, and Paul. I mean, that's quite an elite list of guys that the resurrected Christ isolated for a very unique and individualized encounter. And the first one's pretty easy to understand because Peter is probably the greatest failure in the gospel. In Mark chapter 14, verse 29, Peter says, Even if all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said, you know, famous last words, bro. And Peter disowned Jesus. He denied Jesus three times at, at that trial. And after all was said and done in Matthew 26, it says that when Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times, Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. Why? Because he was a failure. He was an absolute, utter is a jerk. You ever felt that way? I have more forehead to slap than you, maybe. <laughs> this is one of the neat things about losing your hair. You never miss. <laughs> never miss your forehead. Just go up there somewhere and you're going to smack it. <laughs> but Peter represents failures in the body of Christ. And if you feel like you failed Jesus, maybe you've... Maybe you failed him often. Maybe you failed him recently. Maybe you failed him big time. Peter's your boy. And then there are those who are skeptics of the faith. And James is the one who represents the greatest skeptics in, in, the, Christian, in the Christian faith. Now who is James? He was the half-brother of Jesus. The half-brother of Jesus. He wasn't... A full brother because Jesus' father was God. His mother was Mary. James, like the rest of Jesus' siblings, had Joseph as their father and Mary, same mom, as the mother. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, says, isn't this the carpenter? I mean, they're asking questions while Jesus is involved in his ministry. And it says, isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They had quite a quiverful of children. Jesus was the oldest of many siblings, and I know some people coming especially out of the Roman church are surprised to hear that. And the reason we tell it to you is because it's actually in the Bible and it's not uh, a little bit, you know, um, just a hint given here and there. We actually have their names. Jesus had blood brothers and sisters. And the interesting thing about those Guys, is they didn't believe that Jesus, their older brother, was the Messiah. In fact, in that culture, in fact, in many cultures today, even in our own to some degree, when the oldest son, the firstborn son, well, let me back up, back that truck up a little further. When the husband dies, which evidently happened to Joseph, because we don't hear much about Joseph after Jesus begins his earthly ministry. So sometime between the birth of all of these siblings and the time that Jesus was baptized, Joseph is gone, and he's evidently dead and gone and Mary his wife is a widow and so now the responsibility falls onto the shoulders of the firstborn son to take care of mom and of course Jesus would do that except that he's been called to save the world which was no small offense to the brothers and sisters in the family already abandoned by death because their dad died, now they're abandoned by psychosis because their brother has this sense that he is somehow the promised one. In fact, in John 7, 5, it says, even his own brothers did not believe in him. Throughout the Gospels, you'll find them actually coming to where Jesus is teaching to somehow take him home so he will no longer be a public embarrassment to the family. See, that's the problem when you have a brother that claims to be the Messiah. It's, it's really a drag, especially when after the resurrection you recognize that he actually was the Messiah. <laughs> and that's what happened to James. In fact, when James writes the book of the Bible that reflects his name in James 1.1, this is what he writes. James, a servant of God 
and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus was his brother's name. Christ is the messianic office. And Lord means he is now the ruler of his life, of James' life. The greatest skeptic in the history of Christianity becomes one of the greatest followers of Jesus. Why? <laughs> Can you imagine what that meeting looked like? Hey, bro. <laughs> For a guy who just got crucified a few days ago, you're looking mighty, mighty good. And then who's the third that was singled out? Paul. Paul. And he's got to represent the greatest antagonist of the Christian faith. <coughs> Some of you come out of a background where you actually didn't like Christians. You, you, maybe that's even soft selling it. You hated Christians. But I really don't know anybody, I honestly don't know anybody personally who murdered Christians. Not because they had money they wanted or they had some other... You know, there was some other benefit that killing an individual might provide them. But someone who killed Christians only for the personal satisfaction of removing from the face of the earth people who confess Jesus to be the Messiah or to be the Savior of the world. But that's what Paul was. And maybe you remember this next chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile Saul, which was his B.C. name, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which was what Christians were called, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That is how vehemently he hated and opposed Christianity. He not only was talking about murdering them but it didn't matter to him if they were men or women and that is a step further than most antagonists of Christianity even back in the day would have taken Saul did not care he hated Christians and he wanted to kill them so I don't really know who you are I don't know if you failed Jesus I don't know if you've been skeptical of Jesus maybe doubted Maybe you just haven't believed. Maybe you've hated to the point where you've wanted Christians to even die. Actually, it doesn't matter because the grace of God is extended to all of you. And you might be sitting in one of these auditoriums today thinking Jesus would never accept me. Got three words for you. Peter, James, and Saul. That's the cool thing. I, you know, we read in the Bible, the reason I believe the Bible is so true is because we learn the truth about people. And you want to talk about Peter? You want to talk about James? You want to talk about Saul? You want to talk about their sordid unholy, horrible past, then let's talk because that's the truth. But you cannot talk about the truth, not from Jesus' standpoint, unless you also want to talk about grace. Because when Jesus is in the house, you find the perfect balance of grace and truth. In fact, he says in verse 10, but by the what? grace of God I am what I am that's Paul speaking formerly known as Saul James would say the same thing so would Peter and his grace to me was not without effect changed my life the grace that God extended me on that road to Damascus and you can read about it in chapter 9 of Acts you can read about that light you can read about the voice from heaven you can read about when Saul said, who are you? And the voice came back, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. You can read about his response to that. His, woe is me, I think I'm going to get blasted by a lightning bolt right now, response. A lightning bolt that never came. A lightning bolt that never does. 
because of the grace of God has appeared to all of us. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. You can talk about Paul, you can talk about Pete, you can talk about Jimmy, you can talk about the 500, you can talk about the rest of the 12, even though there's only 11 of them. This is what we preach because this is what we all know is true. Verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no re resurrection from the dead? We've been telling you, telling you, I told you, I told you, I told you, <laughs> that Jesus is raised from the dead. I don't know who that some of you are, how some of you can say, because he doesn't tell us. And who he's specifically referring to is anybody's guess. Both Greeks and Jews struggle with the idea of bodily resurrection. But whoever these guys were, they reflected attitudes that were deeply embedded in their culture, much like at times we reflect attitudes that are deeply embedded in ours. The Greeks believed, for example, that everything physical was drenched in evil and everything spiritual was good. The philosophers taught that the body was a prison and that when somebody reached that point of death that it was like opening a cage and a bird flying away. Because the spirit represented everything that was good, the body represented everything that was evil. And the Greeks, you know, in thinking about the resurrection, thought, why would we want to take our bodies along? Why would a bird want to leave a cage and then somehow be tethered by that cage as it tries to fly away? One of the political parties in the Jewish system was a political party known as the Sadducees. In fact, in ours, the, our political system, we have the two main parties, Republicans and Democrats. And in the um, Jewish system, uh, the two primary parties were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we learn a lot about the Pharisees because Jesus was like going at it with those guys. The Sadducees, a little more laid back. problem with the Sadducees is they did not believe in a bodily resurrection of the dead, which everybody knew. So there was a, an indigenous, theological, and intellectual presence in the Jewish system that taught there was no bodily resurrection. And so whether Paul is talking about Greeks or talking about Jews, they all would have a sense within their systems that there might not be a bodily resurrection. But I've got news for you. Uh, it's not the Sadducees and the Greeks that you want to talk to right now. It's the 500 <laughs> eyewitnesses. And so Paul's question is, how can you, you... To us, he would be speaking to us today. Victorville, Apple Valley, Phelan. He would say, how can you living in a testimonial vacuum just decide that something didn't happen? I mean, you might be sitting in your chair right now saying, I don't believe it's going to happen. Paul would say, how can you do that? I mean, forget the Greeks. Forget the Sadducees. Even forget the Apostle Paul. Find someone who is absolutely unbiased. Because I know I grew up in a Christian family, I'm biased. You might not have grown up in a Christian family. You have a totally anti, or at least you're very benign in your bias toward Christians. So let's just get somebody who's not biased at all. And let's say, you know, I can give you 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses, and then get their response. I mean, whose testimony should carry more weight? 500 eyewitnesses to the event or your university professor who was born 2,000 years after the event happened. I'm so excited I can't even talk. <laughs> Look at verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. You know, that's the funny thing about this argument. The Corinthians were not even necessarily saying Jesus was a resurrected. They were saying that we wouldn't be. And Paul's argument, I mean, he's just beside himself. He says, if we aren't going to be, then Jesus wasn't. Because he himself said that his resurrection was only the beginning. I mean, one of those occasions, John chapter 14, verse 19, Jesus said, before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. I mean, that's what he said. Anyway, death is a portal. We better get on to point number two. Point number two is life is eternal. Life is eternal. Death is a, it's a moment. You guys, it's not even a moment. 
It doesn't even exist. Death really doesn't even exist. You just change. You're in time and then you're in eternity. Now while you're in time, you're dying. I know that can't be pleasant all the time. Sometimes it actually happens quickly. For most people who happen to be healthy, it happens much more slowly. Look at verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. I mean, there is this inextricable connection between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of you in Christ. And if one doesn't happen, the other didn't. Go either way you want. But if one happened, the other one did or will. And here Paul says, if Jesus is not raised, then I'm out of a job. Now, I'm out of a job, actually, if Jesus is not raised. I, Tom, am out of a job. But I'm just a pastor. I'm not an apostle. The apostles are all out of their minds because they actually are living their lives differently now because they believe that they saw the resurrected Christ. And Paul says, what am I, what am I doing here? I mean, actually, you guys say the same thing. I mean, there's a lot of cool things to do today. And you are really stupid to be here if Jesus did not raise. Or, since Jesus did raise, if you would not be raised. And that's the point. Paul says we're all raised eventually, all of us who are in Christ. Look at verse 29. If there's no resurrection, then what will those do who are baptized for the dead? You say, what is that? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now, understand something. Paul's not defending the belief that someone could do anything, even be baptized for someone who's died. And this is the practice. Somebody lives their life, and they're not a believer, and so I'm, I love them, and I'm sorry that they died and they weren't believers, so I'm going to be baptized, and somehow vicariously, my baptism will somehow implicate their eternity, and God will forgive them because I'm going to be baptized for them. I'm going to be baptized for the dead. That's a ridiculous idea, and Paul knows it. You say, well, why does he bring it up? Because he's identifying. Some people, this is what's so weird. Some people in Corinth <laughs> who believed that you could actually be baptized for the dead, you could be baptized and it would give some kind of salvitic benefit to a deceased loved one, were at the same time actually denying the reality that people are resurrected. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. He's not saying he believes you can be baptized for the dead. He's saying you guys are, like, not thinking here. Some of you believe you can be baptized for the dead, and at the same time you're saying there is no resurrection. You're not even thinking. Look at verse 30. As for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? That is a very good question, by the way, for this apostle. Especially, I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, I've never been to Ephesus, I've never fought wild beasts. Rabbits are the wildest beasts I've fought. I always win. But, I, I mean, this is just a bizarre statement. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, with no belief in the resurrection, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, we might as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. We might as well go out and make the most of this life because there is no next life. But there is a next life and it's eternal. My father who is dying right now in Iowa would tell you if he were here. I actually tried to figure out a way we could transport him so he could tell you what it's like to die and I know he would say the same thing he always told me over and over and over again life is short eternity is long and hell is hot I mean that's what he said and boy it made an impression right there but that's the point well, why are we doing this if there is no resurrection I mean Paul says why am I fighting wild beasts in Ephesus please give me an answer Without the hope of the resurrection, his life would have been an exercise in futility. But with the resurrection, so clearly in his mind, with that resurrected Christ and that voice and that view so clearly in his mind, the sacrifices that he made, whether Ephesus or anywhere else, were actually demonstrations, not in futility, but in the power of God's love for people. In fact, whenever any of us look beyond ourselves, any of us, apostle or no, 
and we recognize the short-sightedness of the self-indulgence of middle-class America with all of the physical pleasures and the material comforts and the human fame that this culture offers you. And when we see beyond that, and we entertain those higher thoughts of actually doing something redeeming with our lives to serve a cause greater than ourselves to help people beyond ourselves even though there's a tremendous cost to us if you have ever entertained an idea as lofty as that it is precisely because of the resurrection that it would be worthwhile if Christ has not been raised verse 17 your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. I mean, that's the worst thing. It's not like you're wasting your time. It means there's no eternal life because you are still in your sin. There has been no power to back up the check that Jesus wrote on the cross. Everybody knows Jesus died. Paul says, I know he's alive. He's got the power to back up the check. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost if there's no resurrection. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But don't pity me, he says, because I know better. Never feel sorry for me when you think about a wild beast in Ephesus. Because this ain't nothing, man. Because I have seen the other side. I have been to the mountaintop. If Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For as in Adam we all died, in Christ all will be made alive. You know, that's the greatest implication of the resurrection, and we'll process it in much more detail at the end of 15 next weekend. But sin's greatest consequence is death. Wages of sin is, there you go. But the resurrection neutralizes death's power. And this is the cool thing. Jesus doesn't start at the bottom of the list and work his way up. He doesn't start with the small stuff and say, okay, we're going to build some momentum here. He goes for the jugular. He kills death. And then lets all the dominoes fall where they may. And you know what those dominoes look like? A realignment of our relationship with our Creator. <laughs> If the wages of your sin is death and Jesus eliminated any lasting repercussions of that penalty, what can you conclude about your sin? My favorite verse in the Bible is what you conclude. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is there, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Why? Because death died. It rained for a long time. And now... It's dead. And you will live forever. And that first fruits idea, you've got to love that. You see, the first fruits is a concept that's loaded with meaning for the Apostle Paul because he was a Jew. He was a really good Jew. And in the Old Testament, the first fruits of the crop, which, by the way, was the best part of the crop, were brought to the Lord by the farmer, presented to the Lord. And it was an indication of a future harvest. He brought the first fruits, essentially saying, there's a lot more to come. And when the Lord would accept that first fruits offering, it was a pledge on his part, on God's part, of a full harvest to come in the future. In other words, the resurrection of Christ is the first fruits. It's presented to God, and now God is receiving it and saying there are many more of those fruits that will come to pass. There will be many more who will be resurrected based on the resurrection of Christ. And the interesting thing it was, is that it was the first fruits offering, an offering that took place on the day following the Sabbath after the first day of Passover. Now that might be a little confusing for you, so let me help you out here. The Passover lamb was killed, then the first fruits were offered on the day following the next Sabbath. And since the Sabbath is the seventh day, which is our Saturday, the day after the Sabbath is what day? It's Sunday, the resurrection day. The day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, who was the first fruits of resurrected life. Once again, because Jesus was raised, and Paul says, you can ask anybody. There's a whole lot of people you can ask. 
But if you want a definitive answer, he says, come to Papa. Talk to me, talk to Pete, talk to Jimmy. Doesn't matter. Well, I'll tell you the same thing. No matter what form of loser you were, the grace of God is extended to you. And because Jesus is raised, you can be too. Don't be misled, he says in verse 33. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. This is so vital. You know what not believing in the resurrection is? It's like a sin. It's not an opinion, dude. It's a sin. And Paul is, you, you think I'm excited. I can only imagine as he's writing this letter. <sighs> he's just beside himself. How could you not believe in the... Don't allow this truth to be taken away from you because the resurrection is the heart of Christian theology. It literally pumps life into every other element of our faith and practice. The resurrection happened, period. Period. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we are amazed at your grace <laughs> that it's extended to us. And Lord, I just want to say publicly, right now, today, I am thankful that your grace was extended to me. I have no idea how that happened. Because I am a failure, I am a skeptic, and I'm an antagonist. I mean, I, I fill all, all three categories at times. And yet, you are so good to me. And I thank you that you paid in full the penalty for my failure, for my skepticism, for my antagonistic ways, and you rose from the grave. You backed it up. And that's why I'm feeling very good today. And on behalf of my brothers and sisters here, I thank you. And if your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, just kind of thinking about what you heard today, and if you know Christ, I just want you to say a big thank you right now. Just say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Because you guys, we don't deserve this. Unilaterally, unconditionally, he died and conquered the grave. For us. Us failures, us skeptics, us antagonists. Now watch this. If you don't know Christ, I do not know what you're thinking. Because that grace is extended to you as well right now. And if you're willing to A, B, C, A, admit that you're a failure and you need help, B, believe that Jesus, just what we said today, that this is real. Jesus came to save you and choose to place your faith in him. Open your heart to him tonight. Open your heart to him and, and give him the chance that he died to have for your benefit to know him. And Lord, we thank you. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.